me tell you next about some of the renowned astronomical observatories that were international. We find those in Baghdad and Mosul, and these are in current day Iraq and Cairo, in Damascus and current day Syria. <clears throat> But the most famous one was the one I told you Al Tulsi built, and that was the Moraga Observatory. It was built in um, the about mid um, 13th century. Of course, it was under the uh, ruling power of Hulagu, the Mongol ruler. And Moraga was built in current day Azerbaijan, uh, which was part of Persia at the time, Greater Persia, of course. So these observatories contained tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of books in their libraries. If you actually would uh, look at some of those uh, libraries that spanned everywhere throughout the Islamic Empire at the time, and you go even as far west as uh, Andalusia or Andalusia or Islamic Plain, Spain, you find libraries that um, some were even privately owned libraries that contained hundreds of thousands of books. So books were very, very important. By that time, um, paper from China in the early Islamic era had reached the Islamic world, and the Muslims realized very quickly the importance of paper because they needed to document all the translations of the ancient Greek sciences, um, developed this um, paper-making technology further as they allowed it to spread from the eastern side of the Islamic world to the western side. Remember, this was a vast empire. The making of paper spread throughout this vast empire in the era where people traveled on foot and camelback and horse in about 50 years. Paper reached from Baghdad all the way to uh, Cordoba and Granada in about 50 years, in fact. And so, yes, we are talking about books that were using paper, not parchment. Uh, these libraries didn't contain just a few tens or dozens of books, um, as was the case during the Middle Ages in monasteries in Europe, but were actually in the tens and hundreds of thousands. The degree of research that was done in these uh, observatories, because they were research centers, literally, the way we actually view them today, although they were the very early um, research centers, the documentation that the Muslims did at the time um, was really unmatched until our modern times. As I said, the Moraga Observatory was international as it uh, actually attracted astronomers from all corners of the globe who could go to Moraga, including those uh, some from China, from Morocco, from Syria, and uh, other places in Persia and Iran, amongst many others. They actually even um, created like a research fund, if you may, um, for people who wanted to go there and do research, and they can actually uh, get a scholarship to stay at the place and do their work. So the concept even of scholarships um, in as they are attached to educational institutions like an observatory also comes from that time period. But specifically, Moraga was the first observatory to model that where later observatories actually uh, modeled after it. Moraga Observatory went into ruins just because um, later rulers did not actually continue funding of the observatories. There were a few earthquakes that kind of um, shattered the building. And today, um, the country of uh, Azerbaijan actually built a dome, which is not a permanent dome, but it's uh, it's made of... Um, I believe some kind of a cloth material to commemorate the location of the Moraga Observatory. And inside of it, they actually have uh, a museum that kind of shows the history of the Moraga Observatory and what happened, what, what kind of research was actually done inside of it using, for the very first time, large-scale observational instruments. The Moraga Observatory, as I said, was one that other later observatories modeled after. One later observatory that was important was the Samarkand Observatory, uh, 
which is in current days Uzbekistan. Um, remember I mentioned the ruler Ulug Beg who was um, who really loved astronomy and mathematics. He actually built this observatory and, and um, you can see in this picture the uh, remaining uh, the underground part of uh, of an arc that was part once upon a time of the great Moraga observatory. So this still actually exists today and uh, when I talk about large scale observational instruments the larger the instrument the more accurate the observation and that's why up until Moraga you actually had observational instruments that were all handheld but from Moraga and onward you actually would begin to see observational instruments that were large scale that were stationary built into the ground in fact like this one um, at Samarkand Observatory so I mentioned astronomical instruments. Let's take a look, go through a tour of some of those that were constructed by Muslim astronomers. The astrolabe um, is definitely not a Muslim invention, uh, but it was actually it existed before um, Islam came to the region. However, the uh, Muslim astronomers at the time actually developed it to more accuracy than it ever was before and actually added on to that instrument. And uh, here's one such example where you can see the astrolabe, which is um, this picture right here, on the um, Iraqi currency. So this is the uh, Iraqi currency. I know it's you can't read that in Arabic, but... Um, it actually shows how the astrolabe was used in um, in Iraq in Baghdad at the time because Baghdad was the center of science under the Abbasid uh, Caliphate. So we're talking about the uh, 8th and 9th centuries when Baghdad was actually the center of the world in terms of science and music and architecture and I mean every aspect of life. In fact um, the House of Wisdom was actually founded in Baghdad, which would be the older version of modern um, uh, schools and universities where people can actually gather and uh, discuss ideas and develop ideas and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and of course the astrolabe is a very important and was and continued to be for a um, few hundreds of years after um, the ninth century, a very important observational instrument to measure the positions of the celestial objects. Here's another such astrolabe that was actually built to uh, great accuracy, showing the actually and matching the coordinates that you, they would be using them as from. Andalusia or Islamic Spain. So this one was built by Ahmed ibn Hussein ibn Bazo, and this is from the 14th century. And here's a 15th century astrolabe, which now you can see is spherical. Up until this time period, all astrolabes were actually planar, meaning they were just a disk that they would actually be used to look up in the sky and measure. The spherical astrolabe was actually an, a a Muslim invention to go from a disk or a circle up to a sphere, a three-dimensional object, that was a uh, an Islamic invention. Another instrument that was used to measure <clears throat> locations of the planets in the skies was called the quadrant, quadrant as a quarter of a circle. One side of this quadrant actually was used to uh, to measure <clears throat> the um, locations of the planets and then the back side of it actually shows um, a grid that would be used to solve uh, trigonometric problems numerically so if you've ever heard of a slide ruler that people used to use before the invention of calculators this would be the slide ruler for trigonometry or the, cal the ancient calculator for trigonometry and then armillaries were other types of um, astronomical instruments as well. And so uh, this is one from the, the 16th century from the Ottoman era. 
And as I said, Arabic was a language of science at that time period. And so the Greeks, or we inherited from the Greeks the names of the constellations. And so we still refer to the constellations' names the way the Greeks, the ancient Greeks did, using their mythology, you know, as they superimpose their mythological figures onto the night sky. We still to this day use the star names that the Arabs, or again, it's not just the Arabs, but those who wrote in Arabic, actually gave to these stars. And so, for example, if you look at the Taurus constellation, there is a star that's called Ain, and Ain is the bull's eye in Arabic. If you look at the... Um, Let's say Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is a very prominent star in the Orion constellation. And uh, one of the stars, uh, Betelgeuse, is actually one of the two shoulder points of Orion constellation. And Betelgeuse is a corruption of Beit al joza which is the Arabic word for Betelgeuse. If you look at the um, Cygnus constellation, for example, one of its stars is called Deneb, and Deneb is tail in Arabic. And, um, for example, if you look at uh, the Perseus constellation, one of its stars is called Al-Ghul, Al -Ghul, which is Al-Ghul in Arabic. And another one of Orion's stars is um, Rigel or Rigel, however you pronounce it. And Rigel is the Arabic word for foot. So this is one of the lower stars in the constellation Orion, and so on and so forth. In fact, there are over 3,000 words in English that are of Arab origin. They actually are Arabic in origin. Um, and that's, um, as I said, because no science is ever contained inside closed borders or boundaries. Um, but as the Arabs or the Muslims and all the people who were in that part of the world translated and also not just translated the ancient Greeks but also went beyond mere translation to improve on it drastically and change quite a bit of it. They really packaged it and and uh, and uh, eventually the Europeans who got that package from the Arabs and allowed for the Renaissance to come about carried in uh, carried the Arabic words that were in those sciences that remain to this day in English. So I'll give you a few examples that you know uh, from your everyday life. Uh, if you ever use lemons, the word lemon comes from lemon in Arabic. And uh, if you go out and have drinks in the evening and have a glass of alcohol, that comes from alcohol in Arabic for alcohol. And uh, if you're like me and you love artichokes, that comes from, uh, the word artichoke comes from al khershouf in Arabic. And there are many, many, many such words. So let's take a look next at the lines of transmission that allowed that science that developed during the Islamic era to make its way into Europe and eventually to the hands of people such as Copernicus and Galileo and Tycho Brahe and Kepler and many many others uh, whether they're in astronomy or medicine or engineering or mathematics and so on.